you. And on our next slide, I'm going to introduce you to our two panelists. And so we will start off with Dr. Orlando McMeans. Dr. McMeans is the Chancellor of Southern University Agricultural Research and Extension Center and the Dean of the College of Agricultural, Family and Consumer Sciences in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He began his new position on September 1st, 2019. He is also a full tenured research professor in the College of Agriculture. In this role, he has a wonderful opportunity to lead and inspire current students and future generations of students in the College of Agriculture, Family and Consumer Sciences. In addition, he is working with dedicated faculty and staff who are all committed to growing both the Ag Center and the College of Agriculture. In April, he was appointed to Governor Edwards' Louisiana Health Equity Task Force Executive Committee, the Louisiana Food and Agricultural Task Force, and the Resilient Louisiana Commission Rural Development Task Force. Dr. McMeans holds a Bachelor of Science degree in horticulture from Alabama A&M University and a Master of Science degree in horticulture from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And he has earned his PhD in horticulture also at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. After graduating from the U of I, he went on to do his postdoc studies at Virginia Tech in the area of genetic engineering. He served at West Virginia State University from 1998 to 2019, and he departed West Virginia State University as the Vice President for Research and Public Service, the Executive Director of the West Virginia State University Research and Development Corporation, and Dean and Director of WVSU. Dr. McMeans holds leadership positions in many national, regional, and local organizations. He currently serves in leadership roles within the Association of Public land-grant universities, or APLU, a member of the board of directors for APLU, a research policy and advocacy organization dedicated to strengthening and advancing the work of public universities in the United States, Canada, and Mexico. He serves on the board in a commission representative role by virtue of his elected capacity as chair of APLU's board on agricultural assembly policy board of directors. Dr. McMeans began his term as BAA chair in the March of 2018. He is also the liaison to the APLU Council of Agriculture Research, Extension, and Teaching. He also holds memberships in the Association of Extension Administrators, 1890s Dean's Council, and the American Society for Horticultural Sciences. He is a member of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated, Prince Hall Freemasonry, and the Loyal Order of the Moose. Welcome, Dr. McMeans. And then our second panelist, Dr. Phil Elzer. Dr. Elzer is a professor of veterinary science and veterinary immunology and has been conducting brucellosis research since 1986 within the LSU Ag Center for over 25 years. He is the director of the School of Animal Sciences and the executive associate dean of the LSU College of Agriculture. He holds a Bachelor of Science from the Rochester Institute of Technology and a Master of Science and PhD in veterinary immunology from Cornell University. He has authored over 115 peer-reviewed publications and has participated in numerous local, national, and inter international scientific forums. Dr. Elzer and his collaborators have four patents awarded. He has received over three million in grants and contracts. He is the chair of the Ag Center Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee and serves as on many Ag Center and LSU A&M committees. In addition to his research, Dr. Elzer teaches veterinary, graduate students, and undergrads. He has been involved in DTRA-sponsored research since 2005 and has participated in collaborations with fellow research scientists globally. As the Executive Associate Dean of the College of Agriculture at LSU and the Director of Animal Sciences, Dr. Elzer functions as both an administrator and a faculty mentor. His commitment to Louisiana agriculture is evident through his support of comprehensive array of programs offered by the College of Agriculture. As a professor of veterinary science and veterinary immunology, his research and educate, educator benefits his faculty and our student body. Under his direction, the School of Animal Sciences has updated its curriculum and degree programs to guarantee a strong educational foundation so gradu graduates are ensured a successful careers. Welcome, Dr. Elzer. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Marshall to kick off our panel discussion. Hey, good morning, and thank you, Dr. Martin, for those great introductions. So to get us started, I'm going to go out on a limb here and make a bold statement, which I'm guessing is true for the most part, but I could be wrong. 
most prospective students applying to LSU and Southern University don't know or care about what our university's status as a land grant university really mean or how it applies to them. I'm sure I'm not speaking in reference to our faculty and staff of these institutions, but for the students and as a refresher, what does land grant really mean and why should we care? I guess we can start with um, Dr. Elzer. Uh, you put me on the spot first. <laughs> <laughs> I have to take care of my needs. <laughs> Well, first, uh, let me extend thanks to everyone who put this together. It's great that uh, we have a collaborative event this week, and I'm looking forward to more collaborations in the future. And, and this is great that both land grants are together uh, during this career week to prep our students. I'd also like to send uh, regrets from Dr. Richardson, who is the Dean and the Vice President of Agriculture, the interim president of the university system, the LSU system called a leadership meeting. And so he had to attend that. And with, uh, I'm sure you read the papers, we're looking for a new president. So it's critical that he's in on a lot of these leadership meetings and he sends his apologies to the students and Dr. Martin, Dr. Marshall and Dr. McMeans. Uh, now, what was the question now? <laughs> well, I, I have to just tell you, let me give you a little personal thing. Um, what is a land grant? I'm going to be honest with you, when I was a student, I had no idea, you know, and then when uh, Dr. Martin read my bio, you could see I was sort of stuck as a faculty member in the lab, looking in the microscope and land grant, what does that mean, you know, it's like, well, it's somewhere I get to go to school, right, and get to work, uh, but then as I started getting into administration, I started to truly appreciate what the land grant mission was. And I took a leadership class, which is now LEAD 21, and uh, that really helped me understand. So if anything you get out of these uh, talks today, figure out what the land grant mission is, but what it means to you. And one thing, um, and I'll get off my personal thing, one thing that struck me, I was in a meeting with, uh, when I joined the administration, I was in a meeting with a bunch of uh, faculty and Someone asked me, well, who's your county agent? Because they knew I was a research lab rat. I'm like, county agent? Uh, I have no idea. And so I had to learn pretty quickly. And I tell you what, the benefits, my wife's the master gardener. Uh, we, we do a lot with the 4-H youth and that. So uh, please, at this stage of your careers, being young, uh, learn what the land grant mission is and use it to your benefit because it's very powerful. So the land grant, as you know, was uh, the Morrell Act was signed in, I think, 1862 by Abraham Lincoln. And really, they wanted each state to get land, federal land so they could have colleges um, and um, focus on mechanical, uh, and agricult mechanical and agricultural arts. So before then, any type of university learning or higher education was through private schools and people did not have the means to afford private schools. So most people were not educated in the university system. So with the Morrell Act of 1862, federal land was put aside so we could start educating the masses. Uh, and then the second Morrell Act, which was 1890, uh, was designated uh, the land grant institutions for, at that time, the black individuals who were not serviced by the white. So now our 1862 sister institution, which is Southern, for African Americans uh, was established in the segregated Southern states in, in uh, 1890. <clears throat> the third Morrell Act was in 1994, and that was designated, designating uh, land grant institutions for Native Americans. So when you look at land grant, it's, it's really three um, separate uh, federal things that were uh, federal laws that were passed to establish how individuals would get to learn how to do mechanical arts or agricultural arts. And the mission really is a three-legged stool, research, teaching, and outreach or extension. And that's what the land grant mission is. We have to educate, we have to do research which is applicable to the people. We have to teach people how to do it and we have to get it out there in the public through extension. So the land grant mission has three objectives teaching, research, and extension. And Dr. McMeans, I don't know if you wanna 
add more if we go through more history or? I'll just let uh, Dr. Marshall uh, go ahead and ask me the next one. I have a funny feeling it's gonna dovetail uh, after okay. your, your comments. So was that okay? Did, did that answer your question, Renita? Yes, you did. Okay, you thank did. you. Great. So Dr. McMeans, for you, what is the mission of the Land Grant Institution? Well, I, I think Dr. Uh, Elsa did a, an outstanding job of, of describing the, the, the land grant system, but understanding the land grant system has to go back prior to 1862, to understanding that if you weren't rich, if you weren't amongst the elite, uh, families could afford to go to those type institutions, then you were unable to attend the institution of higher learning. Uh, so with that, the, uh, this, this young man by the name of, of Justin Morrow, uh, uh, a young uh, legislator, uh, then in the House, uh, came up with an idea that he took from another individual that was at, in Illinois about the educating the common citizenry in some areas that were obviously left out. As we started to move from the east to the west, we were just growing things, pillaging. We, we didn't know what we were doing with soils. So at that time, a lot of individuals thought that, hey, guess what? Uh, we need to teach some of the applied sciences, some of the practical knowledges that were necessary for us to move and, and to continue to, to strive in this new land. And so what happened with, with, with Justin Moore, he was able to sell that, but I, one of the stories behind Justin Moore, I read uh, several books in, uh, on him. He definitely was stick to it. They shot it down by seven or eight times before it even made, before it even got to the point of passing. And so these institutions were established, I would, and, and the terminology said the common man in mathematics, sciences, you know, applied uh, applications and things of that nature. And so that to me, and some of us argue about this, but today's higher education system were built off of the backbone, in my opinion, of the Moral Act of 1862. We look so similar to what the, uh, the, the initiators uh, or what they envision us becoming. Uh, institutions that will educate young people and take and, 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 and experiential hands-on learning. Everybody act like experiential hands-on learning is new. No, in some instances, some 1890s built their school. So you're talking about learning how to build things. I mean, you go to Tuskegee right now and you can see what students actually learn because some of those buildings are still there. And so, but the, the main purpose of the land grant mission, and I want to convey this because I see some of my people on this call. Thank you, uh, Southern Knights. Um, as Dr. Elsa stated, it is research, teaching, and extension. And extension, you can call it outreach or whatever you want to call it, service, depending on what university you're at. What happens when you sit on a two-legged stool? More than likely, you're going to fall. It's not going to be very stable, or you got some pretty good balance. It is necessary for that tripartite mission to be touching upon all three areas to be comprehensive. That is to have that knowledge that we learn in the laboratory to then translate that into application in the field of outreach and extension and to have our students involved as this research evolves, as this research evolves, then they will leave the university with the most updated knowledge and be competitive. So you have to, the land grant mission is, is very important and it's even more important uh, today as we deal with some of the current societal uh, and environmental issues. Uh, so I hope I didn't jump deep in, but I'm very passionate about the, the land grant because people still ask whether we're relevant or not. And I, I would say to them, we are more relevant than ever. Okay, so with Southern University and LSU both being 1862 and 1890 land grant institutions within the state of Louisiana, we do work closely together with partnerships and collaborations. Can you all discuss some of the partnerships and collaborations that we have together? Dr. Elzer, I'll start with you. Dr. Magnes, you can follow Dr. Elzer. Thank you for the question. Yes, we work uh, extremely close together. 
Uh, each land grant has one cooperative extension service, uh, and that cooperative extension service reaches into both LSU and Southern University. So with that, we have a memorandum of understanding on how we work together, and we share all of our information. We put together a federal report, which is extremely strong because of both institutions and what they contribute. We have shared offices. There's 30 offices uh, or 30 parishes within the 64 where there are Southern University and LSU Ag Center personnel in those offices. Uh, we have um, <clears throat> agents from both areas. We service uh, basically everyone, but we do focus jointly on uh, nutrition education through the SNAP-Ed program and the FNET program. Uh, we also have uh, statewide events like Ag Magic and Ag Awareness events, and we both, both Southern and LSU, uh, contribute to those. When we have field days or when Southern has field days, typically there's a representative uh, from either university or Ag Center at those events. And um, again, the important thing is when you look at it, when we put together our federal report, it's never standalone, and I really want to stress that. Whenever Washington's looking at Louisiana, they're looking at both of these institutions critically. And when we put together our federal report, uh, and I've been doing this for years with Oscar and Melissa and that, I mean, it's a joint effort. It's not one standalone or another. It shows that we are collaborators and we do a lot together. And and I'll just add uh, the compliment uh, what what Dr. Elser stated is that I uh, have come to to know that we are doing some some great collaborations in research. Uh, I I am a proponent of uh, not doing research for the sake of doing research. I think with land grant institutions, you have to be very very intentional in what you're doing. It has to improve the quality of life of the citizens and the communities that we serve. And so in that vein, I was you know, really happy to learn of all the, the uh, climate change uh, projects that we're working, Southern and LSU is working on so many. Uh, and, and I thank my team for, for uh, updating me on that. I think that is very critical because the amount of land that we're, we're losing every day, uh, when you look at from uh, Texas all the way over to Florida, I think it's critical that we stay engaged and that we be amongst the leaders in the United States as LSU and Southern uh, in that area. Also invasive species. I, I did find we have, we, we have pretty good collaborations in, in that area in plant pathology, uh, soil science. Um, and, and not to get ahead of myself, I, I, I do know that we're both doing research in the area of hemp. So, it is just a natural move that we start to work together uh, to, to make sure that uh, as our farmers start to, uh, and ranchers start to look at growing hemp, that uh, we use our collective knowledge and expertise because every, a lot of people think that we have all the uh, cultivation practices and knowledge. Actually, hemp is very new to Louisiana. We don't have the data yet. So we need to be, we need to work uh, smarter. That is that, look at what cultivars or varieties perform well in what regions of the state. So that will take definitely two universities to do. Uh, and, and I hope that we move towards that uh, as I start to talk to uh, Dr. Richardson on that. Uh, but, and, and I also know, and, and I don't want to steal any thunder from Drs. Marshall and Martin, I know we're going to be doing some things on the academic side as well. And, and I'm really encouraged about the correspondences that I've met, I received because I think that will be a game changer for both of our universities. Thank you. Okay, great. As a reminder for you all, this is a chat session. And so if you have any questions, please place those into the chat and we will address them as they come in. What role do you the land grant institutions play in the current COVID pandemic and the role that they can play in post pandemic in economic recovery. Dr. Elzer. Well, I think one thing I'd like to stress during the pandemic is that neither institution ever shut down. 
uh, both institutions continued to serve the public. It was critical for us uh, as the land grants, uh, both LSU and Southern, to keep relevant. And to keep relevant is still to have outreach to the public and the clientele, providing accurate information about the pandemic, letting people know that, you know, we are a source of information. We've also had two national natural disasters during this time, at least two, and uh, we're still, both universities are open in providing information for those individuals. Uh, basically, when it came to over at LSU, we still held all of our 4-H events virtually. I think both campuses went into the virtual mode and uh, people got used to it. Since the rest of our lives is typically virtual now, people got used to it. We had virtual field days. Um, we've had uh, lessons uh, put online on YouTube or news releases or you know, just how-to videos on how to wash your hands, how to make sure your food is safe, how to make sure you don't uh, spread this disease. So I think we've remained very relevant uh, during this time because neither of us closed and we both kept going. Uh, when it comes to the future, only the good Lord knows. I don't know what's gonna happen. But you have to realize we do both have programs set up to help individuals understand finances, to understand nutrition, to understand you know, the cost of a dollar, to understand you know, that you can rebuild and recover from things. So I think we have a challenge ahead of us, but we're up for it because we didn't close. We remain relevant, both institutions, and it's just going to be adapting on how to get people through this pandemic. And a lot of that, unfortunately, it, the reality is going to be uh, counseling, mental illness. We're not uh, mental illness counselors, but we can reach out to medical professionals and help provide that because the anxiety for you as students, for the faculty, for the administrators, for all of us, it's, it's going to be challenging, not only in our, our careers, but our personal lives in the future. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, also comment. The, the one unique thing about the, the uh, land grant uh, system is that we had a, uh, a network of extension programs that was ready to respond to the matter. Uh, we, we did not sit on our hands uh, and this network is very, very organized and, and it took no time to start working and, and getting white papers out and, and developing strategies and, and uh, having, I know uh, many of you are Zoomed out, but many Zoom meetings to look at best practices uh, as to how we can engage. But one of the things that the pandemic did and, and you know, uh, in, in all bad things, there's, there comes some good, but it lifted the veil of situations and, and circumstances that were going on in certain communities that some, some of us already knew. We, we knew how some communities were unhealthy. They were food deserts, uh, that they did not get the medical care that they needed. And this was just magnified through this pandemic. And therefore it changes how we develop programs in the future. Uh, like we need to put money into ag and natural resources to help these small disadvantaged farmers grow fresh fruit closer to those communities who don't have access to that. And also transportation, infrastructure, broadband, it makes no sense for you to have these delivery modes, but people don't have broadband or, or access to internet to access this knowledge. Um, and, and research, it taught us something big time. It costs a lot of money to ramp down and then ramp back up research. Uh, <laughs> uh, and and the land grant uh, experiment station directors got together rather quickly to talk about you know, how we can do this more efficiently and, and, and also the costs associated with it. Uh, but I, I think that when I say that we're more relevant now, all of the issues that have really come to the forefront, I think we are poised and in place to, to start addressing them. And, and some are being addressed, as, you know, as we speak. But I think it goes a long way to saying we need to be very, very strategic and, and make sure we, we, we learn from uh, this pandemic, um, because as we know, it will not be the last pandemic. And I think if, if we learn and put resources there to address, I, I think we'll be better off. So uh, again, I, I think we're very, very relevant uh, today. 
Thank you both for that. As a student, you hear a lot about agriculture research and academia as far as teaching within agriculture, family, and consumer sciences. If I am possibly interested in extension and a possible career within extension, what type of advice or things could I look forward to to try to get more information about a career in extension and what extension actually do? Any one of you. Um, I'll, I'll jump in, Dr. McMaines. We, we, and I believe Southern also, have career paths towards the extension. We have the um, AEEE program here at LSU where we train to be ag educators and you could break off and do extension because extension and evaluation is in the title of that. Um, the other thing is I would recommend that uh, both institutions have excellent extension agents out in the field. Get with your career counselors to look at uh, doing an internship or attending a seminar put on by either institution and where they have guest speakers, especially those from extension, it could give you a feel of what they do. Uh, I think sometimes shadowing, shadowing individuals is a good idea. So I, I think there's formal educational processes for that, but I also think reaching out to the individuals who are putting together career opportunities, be it internships or shadowing programs, they can get you linked up with a uh, extension agent, be it in, in 4-H, be it in family consumer sciences, or be it in ag natural resources. Okay, we have a question in the chat. The LSU and SU Ag Centers provide a great number of resources to the public for free. Where does the funding come from for the research and outreach? I can, I can jump on that. Uh, well, one of the things that it, normally those funds will, will come from the feds. Uh, our main partner is USDA and, and more specifically the National Institute for Food and Agriculture or NIFA. And so uh, that uh, it, it, it kind of depends. For the 1890s, it is really a critical core piece of funding. And it is for the 1862s. However, the 1862s uh, also receive uh, support at the state level. And the 1890s are starting to gain as it relates to um, getting more and more support to support our, our, our land grant mission. But, but what I've conveyed to, to our board when I came in as chancellor is that we're going to really have to look to diversify our funding portfolio because of the standpoint that a lot of these at the state and federal level are running running flat. So we 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 finally after I, I and I could be wrong, but we invested in a uh, uh, advancement director to work with us to to engage corporate America and great and engage our alumni of the ag college. And uh, also, uh, we're just looking at different avenues. USDA is not the only player. Uh, we, you know, we're looking at DOE, uh, DOD. Uh, we're, we're looking at uh, NSF. So there are a lot of other players. And so um, I think as, as land grant institutions start to, to look at these federal and state level funds starting to flat, flatten, we will look at novel ways to increase our portfolio. And I think that's good because a lot of times at the federal and state level with the formula funds, we're very, very restricted. And we need to have enough latitude to, you know, the more latitude we have, the more individuals and communities we can impact. So, so we're, so we, the answer is we used to be basically two or three sources and now we're looking to expand that to, to more of a business model. We have a, <clears throat> another question. How would you handle a situation that a faculty is not willing to collaborate and work even though the grant is written and funded as a collaborative effort? Any one of you? Okay, so I see. I, I, I was trying to be a gentleman, but... Uh... <laughs> Well, you know, the, the, the interesting thing is being a faculty member, you know, um, we, have the, we have that latitude, I'll, I'll put that term out, that latitude to 
to to to be somewhat selective in in what our endeavors if, unless you are specifically a 50 25 25 you have to do what you you, you have to live up to those commitments because you are evaluated and assessed on those we've always encouraged our faculty to work together especially if you write a grant we are we are we are held responsible at the federal level and there's an accountability associated with it and so we we can try to hold faculty accountable but 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 to an extent because of you know you have those freedoms uh as faculty i would say you know as a tenure faculty you you will have a little bit more freedom but if you're seeking tenure and this is how you approach the situation then 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 you will be assessed differently than possibly the individual uh that's tenured um uh, but but the only thing we can do is, is encourage and but but it's but i will tell you what that's all about in my opinion it starts at the top it starts at the top if 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 me and my counterpart as dean and as 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 vice uh president or, or chancellor, if we encourage individuals in extension and research and even academia to work together, if it starts at that level and then works down to the next level of leadership, like my vice chancellors, I think that is very, very critical. And the thing that I love about um, the, I'll give you an example. What I love about uh, Renita's and Amanda's relationship is it, that it was just a natural thing of two individuals who want to do the right thing for the best interest of the students that we collectively serve. So if you go and approach it from that passionate standpoint, then you can't help but have followers. And those who don't want to follow, um, you know, they can go by the wayside, but we want individuals who, who see the bigger picture. And if you don't see the bigger picture, that you're you're losing out on that that uh, actual opportunity because that's what I see it as, and I think L here is an opportunity for LSU and Southern to be the grand example of 1890 1862 collaboration on all three mission points, and so I think we're off to to a, to an outstanding start in expanding those collaborative efforts. Now. Dr. Marshall, I have a question, if that's okay. And so this is for both Dr. McMeans and Dr. Elzer, just kind of as you think about the next three to five years um, in your leadership roles, what are maybe two major initiatives that you either want to see in terms of partnerships between the two institutions or just things that you want to focus on, whether it be on the Ag Center side of what we do or the college side of what we do to improve the lives of citizens within Louisiana or just our impact globally? And what we do within agriculture and those related sciences. Um, do you want me to go first? You want to go first? You go. Okay. <laughs> Two initiatives over the next three to five years to enhance the citizens looking at both uh, collaborative efforts between the institutions. Um, I would say the academics for sure. I know you and Dr. Marshall are working on that and Dr. Richardson, uh, Marshall, Martin, and I have met about, and McMeans have met about that. Um, academics, for sure. We need to, we need to enhance diversity, and diversity means of all people, and we have opportunities here at LSU with educational um, career paths that are unique. Southern has unique opp opportunities for educational career paths. And we need to start cross-listing. We need to start working together. We need to come up with a dual degree program. We need to come up with a dual major. We need to come up with minors. And I know the two of you, Dr. Martin and Marshall, are working on that. So I think that's one of the top priorities of mine, looking at the academics. The second one, uh, not to um, push extension aside, I know they have a great working relationship, but it would be in the research arena. Uh, you know, I've been here over 20, going on 28 years, doing research for at least 25 of those, and I never worked with anyone from Southern University. I, I knew people over there working with rabbits a long time ago and, and with the GOAT program, and Dr. Marshall and I would uh, pass in the night, you know, when we had a field day every two years. But really, there was a lot of things I was doing as an animal scientist, and she was doing, and 
others that we, there was never crosstalk on research. I think that's the one area that really, really needs developed. And I would love to see some type of collaborative research efforts between the two institutions. And, and I'll just uh, piggyback after those comments. The research side is, is I think uh, we, we're doing some great things, but I think it's, it's wide open. Uh, there are some areas that we're looking to grow and emphasize at the uh, Ag Center at Southern. And um, I really do want us, as I stated earlier, for us to really um, engage one another around hemp research, uh, because we, we um, just the other day I heard someone try to grow hemp, and I know the researchers on both sides would have told this person that, that that's not the correct way to do it, and they, met, they basically lost a lot of money. And they had a hot crop, which meant that it was uh, be above 0.3% THC. And so, uh, and the other one that I, I, I want to engage Dr. Marshall with, because we've all been challenged by, uh, by the legislature, and that is an ag technology. And that is uh, precision agriculture, smart agriculture, uh, because if we had our drone technology as it relates to picking up the UV, as it relates to we could put that up against a standard and say, uh, sir, your crop is hot uh, and you need to look at mediation practices to drop that level down uh, a couple of ticks. So I, I definitely think there are so many opportunities in research. And uh, I, am, I am going to charge uh, Dr. Walker, Kevin Walker, with, with starting that process of having those discussions. And we'll look at where we are at through, through a matrix. Uh, and, the, and the second one, as I looked at our list of extension uh, collaboration, there, there are some areas missing. There are some areas missing. And I know we have complementary programs in those said areas. And so I think then uh, again, uh, uh, with Dr. Deshaun York, I think we, we have an opportunity to, to further engage because she's already, of course, with FNF and SNAP Ed, she's already engaged with LSU in those endeavors, but I think there are some other opportunities in, in, in ag and natural resources, uh, community and economic development, and, and, and especially youth development, especially youth development, because we are steadily seeing decline in the number of youth that want to head into agriculture, but yet we have having all these agricultural issues like feeding 9 billion people in the future, you know, so we, we have to grow the next uh, crop of horticulture, no pun intended, a uh, crop of horticulturalists, agronomists, animal scientists, uh, pathologists, and tomorrow we have to start uh, bringing about that new uh, 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 crop of individuals who are going to carry on after we've retired and moved on. Okay, another question in the chat. How are the universities responding to recent hurricanes, Laura and Delta? Is there a collaborative approach? One of the things that I could say, I, uh, the extension program at Southern has been very, very proactive in, in that space, not reactionary, because we continuously uh, have webinars and, 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 and use uh, other platforms to uh, educate the public on preparedness. Uh, uh, to be quite candid, I think we can do a better job in, in being collaborative in that, in that effort because, look, um, even though this is a novel year, I don't know if it'll be novel going forward. Uh, I, I think we're going to have to put more emphasis in preparedness. And, it, and it, I, think it, it, I know it will take both institutions and our collective talents, knowledge, and access to, to technology. Uh, and I was just having this conversation with, with my mother. She was saying, do you think it's, this is just a, 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 an, an outlier? I said, unfortunately, I don't, I don't think it'll be an outlier going forward. And so I think preparedness is going to be very, very necessary. And this is something that uh, I think we should have further discussions in between uh, the two ag centers. Okay, before I turn it back over to Dr. Martin and um, for our closing, do we have any final questions?
Okay, one came through. What advice would you give students who may be unsure about their future career options in agriculture? Um, stick with it. And so, I mean, what's the saying? If you slept in a house, if you've eaten food, if you put on clothes, if you're breathing air, if you're drinking water, you're dealing with agriculture. So there's tons of career opportunities out there. Uh, the, the, the problem is those, ind those individuals who think, you know, steak comes from the supermarket or milk comes in a carton and there's no animal involved, or they push for all organics or all naturals, not realizing that 95% of the population uh, relies on non-GMO or GMO foods and that. So I'd stick with it. Um, there's so many opportunities with so many career paths, be it plants, be it animals, be it the environment, be it clothing, be it uh, timber, be it um, you know just nutrition and food, food safety. There's so many things out there. Agono ag agronomics, economics, looking at um, uh, just the whole concept of education. Uh, stick with it. I think there's tons of opportunities in agriculture. And sometimes you have to think a little outside the box as well, how you're being traditionally uh, taught. And you have great counselors and administrators on both campuses that can help you figure that out. And the only thing I will add to that is uh, one, of the, one of my new approaches because the beautiful speech and the words, you know, Dr. Elser, that is very, very important. So I'm taking a different approach with students. I actually bring them a chart and show them how much uh, with a BS in turf management, how much you would make as opposed to uh, uh, a BA in, a, in, 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 in business or something, a BS in, in business. And it blows their mind away. Um, you know, I, when I was at the University of Illinois, when someone got a degree in turf management, they were making up to six figures. Um, and people don't know that because when you talk to young people, they don't understand how broad the ag industry is. And then uh, they gave a crazy statistic, more than approximately 50% of USDA uh, individuals will be retiring in the next three to five years. And so you're going to have thousands upon thousands of vacancies, and those are really good jobs. And then, and and as a person that's been in agriculture for my entire life, almost even working at a plant nursery when I was 11 or 12, uh, the quality of life that it afforded me in my family, you know, I just can't express it. And and I think we have to do a better job of educating, especially young people. And and by the way, it will come out in the governor's task force among the recommendations is that the, the two land grant institutions need to develop strategies on how we can engage young people uh, on opportunities in agriculture. And I, I think we have the people to do it, but I just want to throw that out there because and let you know it's coming uh, because we're losing people uh, and, and the generation of farming and agriculture is just disappearing. And so, but I, I just think it's an excellent opportunity for you to have a high quality of life. And there are so many uh, opportunities in whatever you want to do in, in, in this broad area. Thanks. Thank you. And Tyler, thank you for this question. I think this is a perfect um, summary question. Many students graduate from a land grant institution with little to no understanding of the land grant mission. What efforts can be made to enhance our students' understanding of what it means to attend and graduate from a land grant. Uh, I've long said this and the institution I just left uh, finally included it in the orientation into the into the, the, the initial courses, whether that be within the College of Ag and in some instances university wide or open it up to the university wide and explain what a land grant institution is the importance of it the significance of it and 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 to be quite candid that's such a great question it's an opportunity for us to recruit those individuals who have not made up their mind and and if we do a great enough job of saying these are the opportunities available to you it is not what you perceive agriculture to be uh and and i, I think um 
uh, integrating that in, in any type of origins or orientation or freshman or whatever, I think that's the opportunity. And I think it's not done enough, uh, but some institutions do a pretty good job at it. Pretty good job. Okay. Dr. Martin and Ashley, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Marshall, and thank you to Dr. McMeans and Dr. Elzer for your time this morning. Um, we'll make sure that you have contact information. I know a couple more questions came in the chat, so that way I know both of these speakers would be happy to follow up with you if there are additional items that you wanted to ask them or just talk about their experiences and their leadership roles on both campuses. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Ashley Grant, and she is going to close us out and kind of share some wins for the week of our Louisiana Land Grant Ag Career Prep Week. And then there's also information on a survey. And so if you could give us some feedback on this experience within the panel, that will help us as we plan with our partners at Southern University for the future. Ashley. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Um, so just to give you a little history, um, I joined the team at the LSU College of Agriculture just about a year ago. And so last year's career prep week was my first career prep week. Um, and I was so excited that we were able to partner with Southern University on um, this year's career prep week, which was a new and virtual format, which for many of you, you can understand there's a lot of uncertainty around a virtual format. Um, but the partnership has been so rewarding and I just want to thank um, Dr. Marshall, but also Dr. Melian and Saturn Douglas um, from the Southern University Agriculture team. They've been instrumental in promoting and planning these events um, to students and really students with these questions where you say like, you know, what do careers in agriculture look like and is there demand for careers in agriculture? Um, the fundamentals of your career starts here being able to collaborate, work with others, um, come together for these type of events, you're truly learning skills that every employer wants. Um, and also agriculture degrees teach you to problem solve. So, you know, if you're somebody who's open and collaborative, a team player and can solve problems, the future is bright for you, regardless of what your degree is. Um, so just some wins for the week, which I'm really excited to share. Tuesday, we had two different career exploration panels. One that was Ag Careers in California with six different panelists representing different areas of California agriculture. We had 100 student attendees, and these are attendees from both LSU and Southern University. For our textiles, apparel design and merchandising careers in California panel, we had 73 attendees, um, which is very exciting, and three all-star panelists um, there who shared their experience working in California, the fashion industry, on Wednesday, we did some virtual speed networking via Zoom. We had 70 student attendees and 16 alumni and industry representatives leading those speed networking sessions. And then on Thursday, I am pleased to say we just got the numbers in for our virtual ag career fair. We had 567 total group and one-on-one -on -one sessions attended. So this may mean that students attended like two or three group sessions or two or three one-on-ones, um, but this is so exciting to see. And um, through these group and one-on-one -on -one sessions, students were meeting with 38 employers, graduates, graduate and professional school programs were represented. And then over the course of the week, we have reviewed 85 resumes as well, which is a big number for us. Um, so just some wonderful numbers to share. Thank you all for participating. I hope that you felt this week was valuable and helped you develop those professional skills and prepare you for your next steps uh, after graduation. And then, like I mentioned, we do have a survey. Um, this getting feedback on these virtual events is so crucial. So I will drop the link in the chat. It is a two question survey. So please take just a minute to fill that out. Um, and then for those of you who attended the career fair yesterday, we will be sending out a little bit of a more comprehensive survey just to get some feedback on that event. Um, but I'm excited to see we've had, I think our high number for this event was 90 people. Um, so it was a great conversation. and wonderful to see such high numbers for these virtual events. Um, and I will turn it over to Dr. Martin just to close us out. Thank you, Ashley. And so that concludes our 2020 Louisiana Land Grant Ag Career Prep Week. I know our team and our team at Southern are 
ready to wrap up the week. We enjoyed spending so much time with you in the evenings with you. This has been a great experience for everyone. And we look forward to making it even better and building those strong partnerships as we go forward. Again, if there's anything that you have questions on or feedback, feel free to put that in that survey and we will follow up with you. I also dropped the emails for Dr. Elzer and Dr. McMeans in the chat. And so if you wanted to follow up with them, feel free to reach out. Thank you and have a wonderful weekend.